On this week's show, the world's fittest man, Dean Conarsis. We're in Greenland to see how the beautiful game is developing. It's a case of fastest fingers at the Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Cup in Moscow. And we see what it takes to complete the Spartan race in Sweden. My name is Maria Prevolaraki and I'm world champion in wrestling. I've qualified for the Olympic Games in Tokyo, where I'll compete in freestyle wrestling for Greece. I started wrestling when I was eight years old. My father was a former athlete and coach. He was the one who introduced my brother and I to wrestling. It's something we just grew up with, and for me, the training room is like my second home. I've won medals in both European and World Championships, but the greatest moment in my career is when I managed to qualify for the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio. I was coming back from a very serious injury which required surgery on my neck. A lot of people didn't believe I would be able to qualify for the Olympics, but I proved them all wrong. The fact I was able to qualify so soon after my surgery makes it the best moment of my career. It means more than any other moment or medals I've won. Unfortunately, here in Greece, the level of female wrestling is not high, so I have to train and compete against male athletes every day, where the level is higher, but it makes me more competitive. I think there is still this stereotype that wrestling is mainly a man's sport. A lot of people think this is because they consider it a dynamic sport which requires only certain skills. They believe that strength is the most important aspect of wrestling when it comes to winning, and when they think strength, they think masculine. The reality is different, though. If people learn a bit more about wrestling, they would see that it is a very technical and mental sport that women can equally do well in. Sometimes I've had trouble finding a training partner because the men don't want to wrestle a woman. When I was younger, it wasn't a problem because the skill level and strength was pretty much the same. But from 15 onwards, the boys tend to get stronger and girls find it harder to compete. It's why now, even though I'm 28 years old, I'm training at times with boys aged 16 to 18. I'm Mohsen Pariai. I'm the coach of the women's national team, and I'm helping Maria Prevolaraki prepare for Tokyo 2020, where she will compete in the Olympics for the third time. I first met Maria when she needed a training partner. It was at a training school, which only taught Greco-Roman wrestling, and Maria was almost always on her own. Because of this, I offered to train with her in freestyle wrestling. That was around 2007, 2008, and we've been wrestling ever since. Training for competitions, preparing. I'm her training partner and her coach. I try to help her as much as I can. Wrestling and training in Iran is something a woman can do because the country has a number of female wrestlers. But due to political reasons, women wrestling is not looked on in a favourable light. Unfortunately, we have a similar situation here 
where women are wearing headscarves, etc. And they don't have the same opportunities as the men do, or even like Maria has. It's not a good thing, but I know there is support to make the sport more inclusive here. That's why I'm happy doing what I'm doing, working and training with Maria. I love this sport and I'd like to train more women because I think they take this more seriously than men. Men sometimes don't give their best, whereas women give it their all, fall in love with the sport and go all the way. As a coach, I want the best for my athletes, for them to be as ready as possible. As for Maria, we're working together and we're aiming to better the result we achieved at the 2016 Olympics. I can't say she is going to win gold at the 2020 Games, but I can't say that she won't either. It's very important to me to participate in the Olympics, to represent my country at the world's biggest sporting event. The Games were first held in Greece, so carry extra significance. It's an honour to represent my country and sport. And now for our sporting question. Following their UEFA Champions League victory in June, Liverpool travelled to Qatar for the 16th edition of the FIFA Club World Cup this week. Led by the likes of Jordan Henderson, Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane, it will be the English team's second appearance at the tournament and they'll be looking to go one better than they did in 2005 when they lost to Brazil's Sao Paulo in the final. While the competition will undergo a format change following this edition, the tournament has been dominated by European and South American clubs to date, with teams from both continents contesting all but four of the finals against each other. Which leads us to this week's question. What we want to know is, who was the first side from outside of Europe or South America to reach the final of the FIFA Club World Cup? We'll bring you the answer later in the show. The usually calm waters of Xiamen in China was the setting as Power Boating's F1 H2O Championship staged races on back-to-back -back days. The Grand Prix of Xiamen and Grand Prix of China make up the penultimate weekend of the 2019 season with valuable World Championship points up for grabs. Saturday saw Alex Carella claim victory in the inaugural Grand Prix of Xiamen, his first win since 2017. Jonas Anderson's second place finish meant he leapfrogged Sean Torrente in the championship standings, with the Grand Prix of China to come the following day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really tough because we have been working to rebuild the engines for two boats this uh, yesterday evening and almost in the night, so it's, it's tough with a small team, but uh, everything so far feels very good, so hopefully it's staying in one piece. Defending world champion Torrente could have sealed the title over the double Grand Prix weekend, but now had work to do to catch Anderson. So I'm three points behind now and I was three points up coming in. Our goal is always to have our fate in our hands in charge. So we have, have, have to have another good race today. Yesterday, once I got into a decent point scoring position, I literally just wanted to maintain and finish the race and get my points and move on to today and know I have another chance to, to improve. We're here to win championships, not boat races. I mean, that's my only goal when I wake up in the morning every day is to be world champion. So uh, I want to keep this number one on the boat. Mari Stromoy's third place finish kept her in the hunt for her first world title. It's hard for, uh, for everyone, the mechanics have been working all night, but normally now by this time we are resting, but uh, <laughs> now we have to get ready and uh, we will for sure. Qualifying consisted of three sessions, with six drivers eliminated after Q1 and Q2. All of the main title contenders made it through to Q3, with Torrente putting down the quickest lap with just Stromoy left to run. 
but she couldn't deny Torrente pole position. It's just a credit to the guys, man. We went to work last night, looked at what we made. We looked ourselves in the mirror and knew we got our butt kicked basically yesterday. And we went back to the drawing board, looked at the data. I took some, a hard look at how I was running the race course and said I had to be better. So we got better today. We got half the job done. Now we got to go finish it in the race. Torrente's closest title rivals, Anderson and Stromoy, would start in fourth and fifth, respectively, for the 32 lap race. Despite pressure from Peter Morin and Alex Carella, Torrente made it to the commitment boy first as he took a stranglehold over the race. He extended that lead, but when Cedric de Guayne rolled his boat on lap five, the ensuing yellow flag gave the field a chance to catch up. There is a lot of wave on the turn seven, and uh, when I arrive inside, the boat goes down and turn completely, and the uh, engine is go out of the boat, just maintained by the cable. No sooner had the green restart flag been waved, and it was another stoppage. In trying to pass Torrente, four-time world champion Alex Carella pushed too hard and flipped his boat. Fortunately, the Italian was unhurt. This meant Francis Peter Maureen would be in second place behind Torrente once the race restarted. Another crash, this time involving Tani Al Kamzi, would bring out the yellow flag again. Once the racing got back underway, Torrente would have to defend his position as he held off Maureen in the battle for first. Further back, Stromoy couldn't deny Philippe Schiap or Anderson as the two moved into third and fourth place respectively. And the duo would gain another position when Maureen had to retire due to a loss of power. It wouldn't be the last boat to be lost during the race, as both Alberto Comparato and Francesco Contando had to abandon theirs following a near collision, which caused damage to both crafts. The remainder of the Grand Prix was completed under a yellow flag, meaning Torrente would claim a vital 20 points and move back to the top of the championship standings. Shiap took second spot with Anderson in third. I tried to hold uh, Shiap on my outside and whoops, there was Jonas on the inside. And I, I went up in the air and then I think Shiap came as well. So but it was a very tight race. It was fun. I wish I was on the podium, but we're still third in the championship and it's important. It was a crazy race. Everybody was coming for me. I was just trying to manage the race. I'm just thinking about the championship. I knew Jonas was back there in fourth and fifth. He actually ended up third, but it's just about getting in front of that championship. We're so happy to get the win, especially after yesterday, man. We, we just got our butt kicked yesterday. And the team all rallied and, and we just did a great job, all of us together, the whole team from front to back, and we come back and got a win. Greece is a country steeped in sporting glory. The home of the Olympics and birthplace of the original marathon, it's the perfect place to meet one of the greatest runners of all time, who many simply call Marathon Man. I was in a, a nightclub in San Francisco where I was living on my 30th birthday. And I was celebrating my 30th birthday with my mates doing what most guys do on their 30th birthday. I was getting very drunk. And at midnight, I told my friends I was gonna leave. And they said, it's your 30th birthday. I mean, why, let's have, let's celebrate with another round of tequila. And I said, uh, no, instead of celebrating by drinking more, I'm gonna celebrate my 30th birthday by running 30 miles, which is 50 kilometers, basically. And, and they looked at me and they said, but you're not a runner, you're drunk. <laughs> And I said, I am drunk, but I'm, I'm still gonna do it. And I literally walked outside the bar. I didn't own running gear, but I had uh, silk uh, boxer shorts on, underwear. So I 
pulled off my pants and started running into the night. <laughs> and it took me about seven or eight hours. Uh, and the next morning I arrived at my destination, which was 30 miles away. And, and that drunken night uh, forever changed the course of my life. You know, there was something about uh, struggle that I missed. I had gone on from high school to university, uh, then I went on to graduate school, and then I got a business degree, and I had a very comfortable corporate job in San Francisco. I had everything that's supposed to bring you happiness. I had a good paycheck, uh, I had a company car, stock options, bonuses, but I was empty inside. There was no, there was no struggle. Everything came so easy, and I just remember how running w was tough, it was difficult, it was challenging, and it made me feel so alive. And I think I had a midlife crisis at 30 years old in the bar that night, and that's what compelled me. And I literally resigned from my job and became a runner. <laughs> I've had an amazing career as an ultra marathoner. I've run on all seven continents of Earth twice. I've run a marathon to the South Pole. Uh, I've run across Death Valley in the middle of summer at a race called the Badwater Ultra Marathon, 135 miles nonstop uh, from Badwater, the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, to Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the contiguous uh, United States. And I've run 50 marathons in all of the 50 United States in 50 consecutive days. So I've really, um, I, I think taking running to the next level as far as combining my love of running with my love of exploration and adventure. You know, people often ask me, you know, what do you, what do you think about when you're running an ultra marathon? Because you might be running for 30, 40, 50 hours nonstop. And what gets you into trouble is when you think. <laughs> because it's daunting. I mean, if you've run 200 kilometers and you're exhausted and you've got another 200 kilometers to run, thinking about the future is it's a, it's a heavy weight to bear. So I don't think about anything when I do these ultra marathons. I try to be in the present moment of time, in the here and now, and all I do is concentrate on taking my next step to the best of my ability, and then my next step to the best of my ability. I don't think about the future, I don't reflect on the past, I'm just in the present moment. And it's almost like a zen-like state. You're, you know, your mind is somewhere else, but your body is just focused on one step, one step, one step. Sometimes I'll get in that state for 10 or 15 hours. You know, to me it's about an exploration, not just of uh, the exterior world, the environment, but also the interior myself. So it's as much an inner journey as an outward journey, and I'm just, I'm really interested in the limits of human endurance, like how far can a human go? And the only way to test that is to continually push the envelope further and further out. So I've taken on some uh, amazing challenges. Thankfully, I've succeeded in the vast majority of them, but I've also failed. I've had my failures, uh, but I've, it's been a, gr a tremendous ride along the way. I've, I've had uh, so many wonderful stories and so many incredible experiences. Running to me is the simplest form of human expression. Uh, you don't need anything to run. All you need is the will. So to me, running is, will always be the purest of sports. And Dean Canastas' feats are the inspiration for this week's top five ultramarathons. The Comrades Marathon is a 90-kilometer ultra-marathon between Peter Maritzburg and Durban in South Africa, attracting 25,000 entrants. Runners have to reach five cutoff points in specified times to complete the race, with the winners taking an average five to six hours to finish it. Antarctica is the setting for the last desert. A 250-kilometer multi-stage foot race is the final event of the Ford Desert's Ultra Marathon Series. that sees competitors compete a number of six-day-long races across some of the most unforgiving terrain on Earth. The Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc is an annual 171-kilometer race. With more than 2,500 starters, competitors race through France, Italy and Switzerland, with the average runner taking between 32 to 46 hours to complete the course. The 
Badwater Ultra Marathon is a 217-kilometer race that starts from Badwater Basin in Death Valley, the lowest elevation point in North America, finishing at the summit of Mount Whitney, 8,300 feet above sea level. The Marathon du Sable is said to be the toughest foot race on Earth. Held in the Sahara Desert, Entrants have to complete six stages over 250 kilometers in seven days. Competitors have to be self-sufficient, carrying all their needs in temperatures upward of 50 degrees centigrade. It's definitely not for the faint-hearted. This is Greenland. It's a unique place. Eighty percent of Greenland is covered by an ice cap. It's the largest island in the world and one of the most sparsely populated places anywhere. But despite this isolation, the Greenlandic people have a strong appetite for football. More than 10% of the 57,000 population regularly play the game. The chair of the Greenland FA, which was founded in 1971, is John Thorson. We can't just take the bus to the next town or city. We have to sail or fly, and it's very expensive. This is one of our biggest challenges. We have local committees for each football club that work very hard, raising money for their teams whenever they need to travel. The first football championship was held in 1958, and today the federation boasts 70 clubs with 5,000 members, a third of them under 18. Former national coach and current national futsal coach Tekla Geralui couldn't have a more different background from his players. He arrived in Greenland 15 years ago from Eritrea. It's very difficult because we don't have the resources and it's very expensive. As a volunteer coach in Greenland, you have to pay for everything. You pay for your own transport, the phone bills, the internet. You have to take care of everything, and so family members can get very annoyed when I spend so many evenings coaching, and the only thing I come home with are expenses, nothing else. Geographically speaking, Greenland is part of the North American continent, but history links it to Europe. However, Greenland is neither a member of CONCACAF nor UEFA, let alone FIFA. One of the main problems is that it's impossible to maintain a grass pitch because of permafrost. With the exception of the FIFA-funded artificial surface at Kakatok in the far south of the island, matches are usually played on gravel pitches. The season is heavily dependent on the weather, with outdoor games only taking place between the end of May and mid-September. If we could have an indoor pitch, we could play football all year round, or maybe another artificial surface. That would be a huge help. I also think that the coaches need more tools so we can improve our training and maintain the motivation of young people. The will is there, the motivation is there, the desire is there. Given the enthusiasm, it's a shame that this combination of factors hinders the development of the game in Greenland. Just organizing the national championship takes huge effort on a vast island with no road connections between settlements. Currently, there's a system of local events leading to a final tournament played over a week at a single location. We have four or five clubs. We have a few competitive games in our capital, Newark, because there are four or five clubs who play against each other. But along the coast, where there are only one or two teams, 
it's difficult. When all the towns are involved, the distances are overwhelming. So the idea of a national league is, I have to admit, far off in the future. As well as finding time to train, players taking part in tournaments also have to commit to up to three weeks of their time, as travel to and from the finals can take a week in itself. It's difficult, but they love it, and they really want to take part. It's sometimes a challenge for them to find the time to come and train and get time off work to play in tournaments. If their employer says no, then we have to select the second best player. But they want it so much that some of them voluntarily quit their jobs. It's something we experienced three times last year. They just quit their jobs in order to play football. We were at a training camp in Denmark and we had to travel to Bermuda for a tournament. So when they returned, they had no job. Thankfully, they soon found a new one. They're really dedicated and they really want this. Greenland won home rule in 1979 and along with the Faroe Islands now forms part of the Danish Commonwealth. Their only regular source of overseas competitive fixtures is the football tournament at the Biennial Island Games. It would mean a lot to us to be a part of the international football family. We played international futsal games last winter when we invited the Nordic countries across. But only one of them took part, the Faroe Islands. They came here and we played against them and we were just as good as they were. That sort of thing motivates us. It would be so cool for Greenland, with so few inhabitants and so much land, to make it onto the international stage and play games against Spain, France, Germany, you name it. It would be amazing. I dream about it and I believe it will happen someday, but maybe not in my lifetime. There's hardly anywhere on the planet immune to the charm of the beautiful game. But in Greenland, much work has to be done. Football infrastructure and pitch improvements are required, but such as the enthusiasm, there's no reason to suppose that the manifold obstacles to the sports development can't be overcome. When it comes to sled dog racing, the mind tends to think of icy Arctic landscapes. However, there's also an off-snow or dry land version of this dog sport. The English county of Sussex recently hosted the WSA World Dry Land Championships. Ironically though, it was slightly less dry than advertised. It was fast, wet and muddy. It was good fun. How was that? Typical British weather, but the dogs are enjoying it, and as long as the dogs come back fit and healthy, that is the main thing. Teams of dogs and owners from around the world set out to complete the five kilometre trail as fast as possible. The competition featured a number of different breeds, including Siberian Husky and Alaskan Malamutes, across a variety of racing categories. Some teams range from two to eight dogs, with the driver riding what is known as a rig. It's very competitive in the, in the right circles. It's, um, we've got some of the best teams in Europe over here, and um, it's good to host the championship for the first time in this country. A few solo classes took to the course too, where some entrants cycled or ran alongside their furry companions. With such a wide range of disciplines, a variety of different techniques were adopted by the competitors. Some people believe crouching down creates less wind resistance um, and gets, uh, gets down. Some people choose to lean over to reduce drag. Um, people all have different techniques. Some people knees won't let them do that, so they'll just stand there. So. Uh, it's all down to different techniques for different people. 
With the dogs the stars of the show, a team of vets were on hand at the finish line to check them over after each race. Animal welfare was paramount to everyone involved. If your dog doesn't want to run, it will not run. So find, making sure it's a positive experience, an enjoyable experience, you're doing it for fun, you're doing it together, you are a team. You and the dogs working together to get round, doing it for the love of each other is what it's all about. So there's no prize money here, um, it's all done for fun and for pride. People spend a lot of time and money with the love of their dogs to get them out, exercise them responsibly and really just enjoy that bond that comes as working as a team. And our grandpa made, made us late. It was amazing actually. <laughs> As long as I relaxed, I did really enjoy it. Matt Hodgson claimed the title in the four dog group two class. Very, very hard, very challenging, very muddy, but uh, the dogs did me absolutely proud. They pulled their little hearts out. Um, we got round, um, over the moon, I'm overwhelmed. Um, yeah, something I've worked for, out for many, many years and I'm feeling very emotional right now. The Yota Arena in Moscow was the setting for the 2019 Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Cup. This year's field consisted of 25 competitors from 11 nations, all competing to win a share of the 30,000 US dollars on offer and the title of Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Champion. One of the standout Cubers in the Russian capital was 18-year-old Max Park. The American, who's autistic, took victory in the fastest hand category against Australian Felix Zendags, before defeating Germany's Philip Weyer in the event's marquee event, speed cubing, in a time of 5.2 seconds. This competition is huge for Max. This is the first time he did it. Um, he's been doing more um, different type of a competition that's more local and with a lot of people that he knows. So uh, for something like this international and coming all the way to Moscow was a tremendous opportunity for him and uh, he had a great time. He had a great time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go. In the re-scramble event where competitors are given one solved and one scrambled cube and have to replicate the pattern of the scrambled one, Germany's Ricky Myler beat hometown favorite Dmitry Aniskin. It was pretty cool, so um, coming here as like a defending champion, it was uh, a bit, um, I was a bit nervous, but <laughs> it was fun. So I've been cubing for about 10 years and you just need a lot of practice and just patience and focus, concentration. In the final event of this year's Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Cup, France's Juliette Sebastien claimed victory in the women's speed cubing category after overcoming an early deficit against America's Dana Yi. I was pretty nervous because there's a lot of people watching, so I, I just tried to like uh, stay in the zone and uh, not look at anything else but my cube. Now it's time for the answer to this week's sporting question. Earlier in the show, we asked you to name the first team from outside of Europe or South America to reach the final of the FIFA Club World Cup. The answer is the Democratic Republic of Congo's TP Mazembe. Founded by Benedictine monks in 1939, Mazembe are one of the continent's most successful clubs, having won a total of 36 titles. The Congolese side qualified for the 2010 edition of the Club World Cup after winning their fourth CAF Champions League title. 
Led by the likes of Joel Kimwaki and Robert Kidiaba, they progressed to the final without conceding a single goal, beating Brazil's Internacional in the semis. Unfortunately, Le Cobu lost 3-0 to Rafa Benitez's Inter Milan in the final, and despite qualifying for the Club World Cup again in 2015, they have yet to replicate this feat. We're in a place called Ore in Sweden. It's really cold here. Even early in the season, there's lots of snow. And it's a particularly special place. There are mountains, beautiful village, lots of atmosphere and culture. Um, it's a great place for the Spartan Ultra World Championship. The Spartan World Championship is an obstacle course race often referred to as one of the toughest endurance events in the world. This is testing the athlete that wants to come out for 24 hours, see how many miles they can do. The ultimate goal being to break 100 miles and every lap being five miles uh, with 25 obstacles on each lap. Robert Killian leads the Spartan Ultra leaderboard coming into the race and is the most likely contender to take home the grand prize of one million US dollars. I'm Robert Killian. We're currently in Ore, Sweden for the Spartan Race Ultra World Championships. It's a 24-hour endurance race, and essentially the winner is the person who can complete the most laps in 24 hours. And as you can see, there's some ice and snow and, you know, uh, I guess some um, terrain that's uh, going to be very challenging. A former Green Beret, Killian is accustomed to the mental and physical endurance necessary to thrive in such harsh conditions. I think my military background definitely helps me in this environment. Uh, it's you know something that we do as a Green Beret, as a Ranger in the Special Operations community are obstacles in austere environments. We're out there uh, training in the worst conditions, um, you know, in the toughest uh, environments, so that we are able to then go to combat and not you know necessarily stress out in a you know panic in a in a certain environment or a certain situation. So I think that mental toughness and that experience definitely is what got me into obstacle course racing. I think it what it's what kind of helps uh, differentiate me a little bit between myself and the other athletes. One of those other athletes is Canadian Ryan Atkins. I won the uh, Ultra World Championships last year in Iceland. And um, uh, so yeah, I think I stand a pretty good chance of doing well here. And, uh, but I'm just here to compete and do my best. And um, I just want to finish the race having kind of given everything that I can give and feel completely uh, spent at that finish line. Atkins will be Killian's main competition in Sweden, aiming to repeat last year's success and retain his title as the best obstacle course racer in the world. I think defending my title would mean a lot to me. It's pretty cool to be the best at the world at something and um, it'd be pretty cool to do that multiple years in a row. So uh, ultimately, I just want to have the best race that I can have. If that means first place or if that means 20th place. Um, if I can cross that finish line just completely shattered, uh, I'll be happy. Thanks for showing me around. I only need a couple things, but. Okay, cool. Oh, elevator. Yeah, there we go. Let's not run more miles than we have to, right? And you can choose any race you want. And he's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So he's gonna help me pit tomorrow. Dude named Logan. So, we'll see how it goes. With the start fast approaching, the two take time to prepare their meals for the day ahead. So, yeah, tonight I'm gonna make a little bit of spaghetti. In 600 meters, turn left. For Killian, this is also a chance to reflect on the opportunity that lies ahead. Your destination is on the right. This is the last race of my season. Like, I am done after this. So no matter what, like, honestly, I'm just so excited for that and to be able to go home and spend some time with my kids. Because it was a very tough, uh, tough time this time, you know? Like, I, I've been leaving them a lot all year for races, and this was the longest stretch. I've been gone for a week and a half now. 
And for one of the first times, my son like just started bawling out crying and he's like, I don't want you to leave, I, I want to be with you. And I was just like, that like hit me like really hard. Like it was so hard to come and I, I just want to get back and hang out with him. But I, I would probably regret if I didn't try to take this opportunity because it could be life changing for them to win this amount of money. So it's kind of like a double edged sword. I could sacrifice a little bit now and maybe not have to work for the next five years and spend a lot of time with them versus if I didn't, you know, come here and I was home with them, I, I'd be watching it on TV be like, man, why didn't I go? It is a very large amount of money. It would, you know, give me an opportunity to spend more time with my kids. The main, it's kind of ironic, the main reason I'm away from my kids is to provide for them, but you want to spend that time with them. So I think this would be an awesome opportunity because I could forego you know the next five or six years of having to work and and you know save the amount of money that I could potentially win in one day and and spend a lot of that time with them race day and as the start time approaches the elite athletes prepare themselves for the challenge ahead We welcome you to the 2019 Spartan Ultra World Championship! Aru! 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 The race begins at midday, taking athletes through the village of Aura via a host of challenging obstacles. Ryan and I have battled like back and forth in so many races. And unfortunately, in 24-hour events, I've never beaten them. I've beaten them at uh, three world championship events out of five. But um, so we're about 50, 50 maybe overall. But uh, yeah, like I think we go back and forth and we have, you know, a little bit of personality differences, but we try to, you know, get past those and just, you know, be as respectful towards one another as we can. I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. As the race progresses, Atkins heads the pack, tackling the mountainous climbs with Robert Killian only a few minutes behind. I was aware of uh, where Rob was, but I could only really control what I was doing um, in my race and I just wanted to throw down consistent but maintainable kind of laps for a while. I think I did a bunch of laps that around an hour and 19 minutes, which was about 10 or 12 minutes faster than he was doing. So that really built a big lead uh, pretty quickly, um, lap after lap. As night falls, athletes continue into the darkness. Trails becoming perilous, obstacles slippery, and injury inevitable. I fell on a, uh, a bucket, like, and it hit me right on. on top of my patella. Come on! And I think that impact when I slipped on the ice, I think that just kind of bruised it. And then as I continued to run on it, it just got worse. Ugh, come on. Thank <laughs> you. 
Vamos. After 55 miles, I sat down to eat some food, and that's when my adrenaline kind of like started to subside, and I really felt like how much it hurt to like bend it. You know, the conditions are getting worse. It's really windy, it's cold, it's dark. There's a lot of ice on the course, and I was just seeing people falling like all over the place. And it just, I don't know, it was, this is literally the first race where I've ever listened to my body and actually stopped. And I was gonna stop after 30 and I, I still like convinced myself because I'm so stubborn to go to 55 miles. So I did five laps more when I told myself I actually should quit. I just didn't, you know, I didn't feel like going on anymore. My knee was hurting. Um, I was getting past and I, I just wasn't enjoying myself. And I think once you get to that point, I just felt like if I had a bad experience and kept pushing myself, it might take away from like future events. And I don't want to lose that like, you know, enjoyment that I have from obstacle course racing. With Robert Killian no longer in the race, Dawn brought with it the opportunity for Ryan Atkins to close in on his second Spartan Ultra World Championship title. Just in the morning when the sun came up and we could get rid of our headlamps, no longer need them, that's such a nice feeling and being able to race with, you know, natural light for a while. Um, it's like, it's so great. Whilst Atkins had not run enough miles to claim Spartan's $1 million prize, victory ensured he retained his title as the best obstacle course racer in the world. is a really good, gritty, gnarly, raw race that really lends itself well to uh, butting up against those physical limits. And yeah. when I'm in that situation and kind of going after uh, the maximum of what I'm able to do, that's when I'm kind of the most alive. In total, Atkins ran 80 miles in 23 hours, 22 minutes and five seconds, finishing the race almost an entire day after it began. Coming into the finish line, all the village was kind of waking up and people were coming out and starting to cheer. And uh, the, whole, the whole lap was just a bit of a celebration for me. It's really special to come back and uh, be able to defend my title, something I wanted to do all season long. Um, this race was kind of a big focus for me. So uh, to be able to uh, show up and perform on the day of is uh, it's a good feeling. That's it for now, but join us next time for more sporting adventures around the world.